Hello, hello. I'm so excited today to have Rhodes Yepsen, uh, the Executive Director of BPI, uh, join us uh, for this interaction. Uh, Rhodes, uh, you don't know, the, you probably don't remember and you don't know this, but I've met you a couple of times in the Sustainable Packaging Coalition and then another place, maybe it was a TAPI conference and I don't remember where it was, but you were speaking on this uh, in the smaller forum. And I was so impressed when I heard you speak and the clarity of mind in terms of systems thinking was so strong and I had so much to learn at that point. And I did ask you a couple of questions, which I'm going to ask you again, because, you know, in a, in a, in a setting where there are too many people, you can't get the, you know, the complete spiel. So I'm excited about having you to myself and asking you more and learning more. So this is, this is for me going to be a master class because, you know, I've been uh, reading a lot about, uh, the, the things you've been writing, as well as, uh, you know, some of the things that are available on the internet. And um, so my wife calls me a delusional optimist. And uh, that's because I just sort of believe everything is going to be okay. Uh, but when I read your stuff, I realize it's so much more, you know, it's so much more about systems thinking. So thank you so much for taking the time and joining in. And sorry for this long spiel of an introduction, uh, but uh, but I'm, we are very excited to have you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me and excited to have this conversation with you too. Uh, so Rhodes, uh, one of the things that I could not find so much on uh, online and uh, and whatever research we did was about Rhodes the person. So I want to talk more about, I want to start with uh, knowing you better and, you know, your childhood influences, what got you to this place where you, you know, think so strongly about leaving the planet better. So, so talk to us about your early influences on maybe packaging and waste and what have you, whatever comes to your mind. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in rural Pennsylvania um, and had my parents are uh, practicing Buddhists and uh, are really interested in um, living a, a sustainable lifestyle. So we grew up as vegetarians. Uh, my parents met working at uh, Rodale uh, Press, so not the institute with the farm, um, but Rodale on the publication side. Um, so they were both writers and editors. Uh, my mom on the outdoors side of things like backpacking and bicycling magazine. My dad. On the, in the book division, working on some of the early organic agriculture uh, texts at Rodale. Um, and so growing up, um, I was outside a lot, um, you know, really sort of learned uh, intuitively about uh, the Buddhist mindset and, and simplicity um, and really trying to be kind to uh, the earth, whether that's those are plants and anim plants or animals or humans. Um, and so from a really, really young age, um, I was interested in uh, environmentalism and what sustainability could mean. And um, that sent me off to Oberlin College in Ohio, uh, where I studied a variety of things and was really attracted to their environmental studies programs. Um, and still, even at college, I think I had a hard time understanding where I was going to fit in to the sustainability world. Um, and after college, did a variety of things. And that kind of full circle brought me back to the Rodale community, um, where I worked at an offshoot of that um, organization called Biocycle Magazine. And Biocycle is the forerunner, you know, publication on composting and organics recycling more broadly. Uh, so I got firsthand experience as an editor and a writer and a researcher on all of these topics that I had only known a little bit about, right? So I knew about sustainable agriculture and local food systems, but I didn't really understand the end of life aspect of all of those things. And as I learned more about food waste and the importance of compost and large scale composting programs, uh, and the connection to the sustainable packaging movement, um, I knew that I was hooked for life, that right, this was my niche uh, for sustainability. Um, it wasn't just about sustainable ag more broadly or local food systems, but it was really trying to figure out um, the end of life of, of these materials, uh, how we reduce how much we waste, um, and how we really think about this from a systems perspective. This is this is almost music to my ears because this is all I think about from the morning to night. So, so it's it's wonderful to hear that. Do you do you have memories, early memories of packaging itself? Like, uh, is there is there certain points that you can think of that that influenced you and impacted you that you know this is not something that should be there or I don't know. It's, does something come to your mind when you think about packaging early on? Um, not really, to be honest. I mean, I, I have, you know, distinct memories about uh, recycling um, and, 
how, you know, growing up, it's still the case in many places uh, around the United States, but growing up, I, I think I was aware that, uh, right, it took extra effort to recycle uh, than it did to, to throw things in the trash, um, that we had to pay extra for recycling. Uh, you know, so, you know, there, there were impediments to this, right? It was harder to do and you had to pay more for the uh, benefit of having a recycling cart. Um, and I think those things are, you know, were in the back of my mind. Um, but beyond that, no, I didn't really have uh, a lot drawing me to, to packaging until I got into food waste and composting and started thinking about um, how challenging it is to divert food scraps in particular to compost, right? And thinking about how uh, it's, it's really hard. So I grew up with a backyard compost uh, pile um, and we had a little food scraps bin. And so I was used to the fact that that could be a little messy um, and stinky. Um, and it wasn't until working at Biocycle Magazine and sort of reading about some of these early compostable products, food scrap bags, right? They were probably the first one to be developed. And it was really critically based on how do you make it easier for people to collect their food scraps? And that had a really um, important connection to me. So even before packaging, just this, this tool, right? How does a, why did a compostable bag exist? It was like, well, we wouldn't expect people to be um, collecting their trash without a plastic bag. Um, and telling them you're not allowed to use a plastic bag. But now we're telling people, well, let's take the food out of your trash, the wettest, stinkiest part of it, put it in a separate bin. But, but that's okay. You're, you can just line it with newspaper. or You don't need to line it at all. Just, just rinse it out. Um, that's okay. And as I started learning about these companies that were investing the time and research into developing compostable bags and, the, and how that could boost participation and make curbside composting programs widespread, um, I was just amazed. And that's, that's really what led me to this broader... Um, compostable packaging connection I was thinking, well, if the bag has such an Im a big impact, what about all this other stuff that can't go in the recycling bin today? Um, and then with all of the other news coming out about um, the challenges with recycling, right? That just because you have access to recycle, just because you put it in the bin, um, doesn't mean that it's getting successfully recycled. So that really um, made me think more about packaging broadly. Uh, how do we, wh what is the problem with items um, not getting recycled. If we have access and people are excited to put it in the blue bin, where, where is the system breaking down? And applying that logic to the connection of packaging to food, it is so hard to get food out of landfills in part because we don't have access, but also in part because it's tangled up with all of this packaging that can't be composted. It's a contaminant. Um, and how amazing would that be if we started uh, designing the packaging that comes in contact with food to be able to be diverted with the food to a composting system. Um, and that's when I really um, started spending more time on packaging. Um, but I would say it was, it was the food, uh, food waste and composting um, and agriculture that led me to packaging, not the other way around. I know some people start at it from the packaging uh, perspective. There are so many follow-up questions I have on that uh, you know, spiel that you, you just went through because there is so many angles to this, but I think we'll, we'll cover most of those as, uh, as we go along. Uh, but there's one thing which, you know, in your life journey as you went to BioCycle and then to BPI, but there's this one period where you were with Novomont. Uh, as a right. as quote unquote a marketing manager, but as Emily, our producer, tells me, it wasn't really a marketing manager role. So we are a little confused there. So would love to know what you were exactly doing and how that influenced uh, your evolution and you know why Novamont. That would be the other part of it. Sure. Yeah. So um, I learned about Novamont through my work at BioCycle um, and doing these uh, articles. So a lot of survey research. Um, on residential curbside composting programs. Um, and then there were some of these early uh, survey articles uh, interviewing companies who were involved in compostable packaging to really try to get a sense of um, what these materials were, what types of products they were going into, uh, the success stories, early success stories. And when I talked with Novamont, they were one of the uh, ones who was really excited to talk to me about um, this connection to food scraps, right? Uh, this importance of compostable products being view viewed as a tool, not as a, a as a replacement for all plastics. Um, this has increasingly, I think, become part of the mantra for for a lot of companies, not just for Novamont. Um, but I think that they were the the one that gave me that early thread. Um, and so I, I did some articles uh, looking at Italian case studies with Novamont, um, and you know. Uh, was just really attracted to their approach. Uh, and they offered me a job as a consultant uh, before they had a North American office. 
um, helping them on these topics of residential curbside programs, um, going to conferences and helping represent them um, and help them understand where things were going in the U.S., for uh, food scraps composting more broadly, but also uh, composters and their their feelings about packaging. Uh, so when they opened a North American office, um, I was hired on uh, full time. And yeah, the marketing manager position was really just because of the way that um, Novamont had had things structured at the time. Uh, their experts on waste management and recycling and composting were, were within the marketing division. And so it was just a title that made sense considering there were three people in North America, uh, rather than giving me a waste specialist title, it just made sense to uh, put, the, put the marketing manager title on there. So let's, let's do a little segue and, uh, and uh, move towards BioCycle and then BPI. You know, uh, it'll be great to learn more about both of these, uh, both of these uh, institutions that have had uh, a great influence, I think, in your life. And, you know, you've all obviously built them. Uh, so, so what was, uh, what was BioCycle's agenda first? And uh, how did you evolve that? And then, of course, switching to BPI. And I read a little bit about uh, BPI's evolution with uh, Stephen Mojo, I think, Steve Mojo, and, you know, how he started it back in 99. So, you know, a little bit about BPI as well. Sure. I, I will be the first to say that I, I don't think I had a big influence on, on BioCycle. It had an influence on me. Um, you know, they are an organization that started... Um, with the compost science and utilization was the, the first publication um, and really grew out of the early days of Rodale when um, Organic Gardening Magazine was organic gardening and farming. And it had a broader scope, not just the backyard gardener. And compost science, uh, when it was a Rodale publication, it was started in 1960. So before the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. So you think about this publication, this like uh, real force to be reckoned with, early on, these really early texts coming out in both book form and journals and magazines talking about um, this big problem. There are these books uh, about the food and city connect, uh, connection, um, you know, how we had this increasing uh, divide be between cities where people lived and where food was grown and where waste needed to be managed. Um, and so BioCycle, uh, when I came in, was really, you know, focused on the whole broader picture of organics management, right? And so that is yes, for sure about composting, um, but also anaerobic digestion, uh, soil quality and soil health, upstream programs to mitigate food waste. Um, and so we, sp I spent a lot of time doing everything at the, at that, um, magazine. Uh, so looking at equipment, you know, grinders and shredders and screeners where we would survey the equipment manufacturers to really profile, you know, what, what were they offering? What did these pieces of equipment do? Um, looking at anaerobic digestion, you know, is this something that stands alone or should it be done in concert with composting? This is a topic still being debated today. Um, and so, yeah, BioCycle, you know, at the time had a, a print magazine, um, had conferences that it led. Uh, and so I got to see all aspects of that. Um, and yeah, I, I don't I don't think I've had a whole lot to shape with it. There was one interesting connection that um, when I was a staff member at BioCycle, uh, it was the early days of a database called findacomposter.com. And um, BPI, uh, which I didn't know much about at the time, was the, the founding sponsor that gave money to help start this activity uh, at, at BioCycle. And then um, coming over to the BPI side, uh, we continued to be a sponsor and actually have taken over stewardship of Find a Composter now. Um, so that's been kind of exciting to see uh, that connection play out. Um, BPI, yeah, it was founded in 1999 um, as a nonprofit focused really on how do we start to uh, clarify claims in the marketplace. Um, so in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, there started to be more and more claims about uh, bio-based plastics, biodegradable plastics, and there were a lot of uh, lawsuits coming out from attorney generals in the U.S. Um, questioning these claims that companies were making. And so a big five-year project um, in the 90s um, at ASTM looked at all of the academic literature uh, on composting, best practices for composting, um, real-world field testing uh, of products and materials, uh, lab testing, pilot scale testing, um, and came out with the ASTM specifications for compostability. Um, BPI was right on the heels of that, forming to basically help companies go through the process of testing and making responsible claims. Um, and the certification launched in 1999 was actually a joint partnership 
between BPI and the U.S. Composting Council. And the original logo had the U.S. Composting Council and BPI's mark on it um, as a way of uh, saying that products tested to these standards will break down in facilities operated to the uh, Composting Council's best practices and their operating guides. So it's a kind of a really neat um, match match made. Um, and I would say that what I've been able to do, you know, briefly, we can talk about it more, um, when I took over for Steve Mojo, who was the founding executive director, I took over seven years ago. I think what I really brought was this biocycle perspective, right? Um, of showing that it's the certification is of, of utmost importance, um, but it's the starting point. It's not the end point, right? And we had to grow and sort of look back through our, by, our bylaws and see, okay, what did our organization set out to do at, at BPI? And it was it talked about the production, use, and appropriate end of life. And it talked about education, advocacy, and certification. Certification third, not first. And so we sort of put our heads around that. And I was like, see, it's, it's staring you right in the face, right in the bylaws from 1999. Um, it's saying we, we can't do this through certification. Certification alone is not going to get us uh, to uh, the system that we need. It's not going to help those items get successfully composted. We need all of these other aspects of how the item is used and how it's uh, collected and, and composted. That's wonderful because you've actually covered my next question, which was more about, you know, BPI's aims and objectives. And, you know, and I know that they're, they're, they're like four broad objectives. And as you as you said, it's it's a, so much about systems thinking, because if you're just a certifier, then you lose the bigger picture. And and that's great to hear. And I'm happy to have more uh, more elaboration on that if if, if that's what you want, um, you know, in, in terms of aims and objectives. Otherwise, I have a bunch of questions. So what do you prefer? No, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's a bunch of questions which I sort of semi understand, but I'm sure many of the listeners would want to understand more because there's so many terminologies in this, uh, in this whole sphere of sustainability that are going around. And I know that you have spent literally your life trying to decipher and, and, and define many of these. So, you know, the first is the idea of recycling versus composting and and you know so so i would love for you to hear your perspective on the on the different well of course we all know that it's different but you know on the on the differences when it comes to the impact on the planet and how do you see those two uh, spheres acting out yeah it's it's exciting and i think that sort of a caveat before i go into that is that i I think that one of the misconceptions is that it's recycling or composting, right? Or um, that we have to demonstrate one is better than the other. Um, and we hear this too with reuse, you know, the, the, the push for more reusability, uh, that somehow reusable systems are going to threaten our, uh, our recycling or our composting efforts. And I, I think that that's another thing that's been pretty exciting, um, you know, it, being at the helm of BPI, I, I get to help shape some of that messaging for our organization. And, you know, um, reuse and recycling and composting are not in competition with each other. We we need all three. Um, and there is so much uh, waste out there um, that we should be reducing uh, before we even get into reusables. Uh, reusables are going to make sense in a lot of cases um, but they won't work for all situations. Uh, some, in some cases, you know, reusables may cause more harm. If, if you, for instance, have 100 re reusable water bottles in your house, um, I don't know if that's necessarily a good environmental uh, decision or out outcome. Maybe there's some other, something else we should be looking at. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's sort of an interesting context when we look at recycling um, and composting and the environmental impacts um, is that when you think about the circular economy, and if you look at diagrams and charts of the circular economy from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, it's not actually one circle, right? It's, it's multiple circles. And the way that it's been divided there, it's not just concentric circles. Um, it's two separate sets of concentric circles. And so um, it's typically color-coded, blue, a blue set of concentric circles um, that talks about the mechanical um, loop, right, uh, uh, of extraction and resource conservation and durables and reuse systems and recycling through mechanical purposes or potentially other, other ways to break the materials back down and have an effective reuse economy, uh, recycling economy. 
The other side of the concentric circles are the green cycles, right? Which are the biological loop, thinking about the biocycle, right? I mean, how great of a name of that for that organization to have, right? The biocycles, plural, um, are that other part of the circular economy. And when you're thinking about compostable packaging and, and composting um, and the benefits and how that compares to recycling, it's a whole other separate thing, right? That's not better or worse. It's just really different um, because you have material extraction from plants primary predominantly, um, you know, renewable sources that are going into these inputs for composting. Um, and so already you're starting from a different uh, spot. It's not about material extraction from uh, finite sources. It's about material extraction from biological sources that can complete this loop. And you start looking at, you know, the, the types of things that go into these, these loops for composting. Um, and the, the huge benefit, climate change benefit from composting really is about the food scraps and the yard trimmings um, and, you know, mitigating the methane generated from disposing of these materials in a landfill or, or on the side of the road. Um, and um, so you get this big, uh, you know, methane mitigation uh, as a potent greenhouse gas, and you're able to get this uh, wonderful soil amendment that has, again, Properties that are kind of hard to describe, right? It's it's not just that it's a fertilizer replacement. Compost has all these other properties, uh, water retention, disease uh, resistance, um, and you know so a soil conditioner to to really help the um, porosity of the soil. And um, compostable packaging has its own set of benefits, but really where it starts to see and, and shine is taking it out of the realm of packaging. So for recycling, to switch back, right? Recyclables and the curbside, a curbside recycling program, that blue bin is all about the packaging and the products that go into it, right? Um, in the composting bin on the other side, packaging is a small portion of what's gonna end up in there. The food and the yard trimmings are the main part of it. And the packaging is really that, that tool to make it happen, to reduce contamination and make it easier for participation. And so I think that's what's really exciting is um, we're able to focus on this sort of broader benefit of composting as this whole separate bin, right, um, from recycling. Uh, and, you know, not just look at the fact that, okay, we're switching from, uh, you know, one package uh, that, you know, maybe is not being recycled today, uh, and now we've found a way to recover it through composting. Um, it's about this broader connection to that, those, bi those biological loops. And I think that there's something kind of intrinsic there, right? People, just like they really want to recycle, I think, you know, understand, right? Things that are connected to food, you know, scraping your plate to be able to compost it versus being able to take your takeout container and toss the whole thing um, in the compost bin. So I don't know if that helps get at it, uh, but I'm happy to answer more. Yeah, no, I am going to come back to this one because I have a, I have a few clarifications on the recycling side, but but let, yeah. let me continue with the question arc and then come back, loop back into sure. this. So what about, uh, so this is something that, uh, again, people are typically confused about, so it'll be great to understand compostable versus biodegradable. Yeah, and um, it's probably one of the more common uh, confusions is around terminology. And I think the simplest way to say it is that biodegradation um, is, is the big circle, right? It is a very broad term. And we need to define uh, in what environment is that biodegradation happening um, and in what time scale, right? And so that's really what compostability is. It's talking about the environment, which is composting, in which the biodegradation occurs. And then it puts other conditions in there uh, and around time frame and, uh, and a pass fail criteria, you know, to really define what that means. So you can have biodegradation in a lot of different environments, um, but claiming something is, that's just broadly biodegradable is, is a little misleading, right? You really need to get specific and talk about um, the environment in which that biodegradation happens. And that's why a lot of states around the United US are looking at banning the term degradable or biodegradable because they see it as inherently misleading to consumers. You really need to be able to define that more narrowly. Uh, and composting is really the you know, main claim to be made in terms of an instructional claim, you know, telling a, a consumer, what do you do with this item at the end of its life? There are some other you know, biodegradation environments um, that are important, I think, environmentally, um, but maybe are less critical in terms of that that communication to consumers for, for what they're supposed to do with the item, things like marine uh, biodegradation or soil biodegradation, um, which are really not instructional about what to do with the item. And uh, just just a confusion I personally had uh, yeah. and I would like to clarify, uh, could biodegradable 
also be environmentally benign versus environmentally beneficial, whereas composting would always be environmentally beneficial? Is that a difference as well, or that may not be the case? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, this whole topic of like, is something benign versus beneficial? I think it depends on what you, you know, what you're measuring, right? And so, um, if something is, uh, you know, going to biodegrade in the ocean uh, rapidly, which is part of the issue, is uh, you know, the ocean is a, is not a disposal environment. We don't want things to end up in there. But if they are leaked into the into the marine environment and they break down rapidly, and we can show that through tests and science, um, does that mean that it is benign compared to a package or plastic that would remain for hundreds of years, or is it suddenly beneficial? So I I, th I have a hard time with that one. I would say that they both have potential benefits um, and that our goal should not be just to be benign uh, to really have a, a positive a positive impact. But it's really going to depend, I think, what you're comparing it to. So specifically, if I uh, talk about something like oxybiodegradable, so is, do, would you consider that that as biodegradable, but breaks down into little, little, little micro particles? I wouldn't call that I wouldn't call that biodegradable. biodegradable at all. It is not no, biodegradable. oxodegradable. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I'm happy for anyone listening to the podcast to prove me wrong and send me test reports. But to date, uh, we have not seen any test reports showing that OXO biodegradable actually biodegrades uh, completely. Right. And so this is this gets to the you know environment, the time scale and the pass fail. Right. A, a threshold that you need to meet. Um, I do believe that, you know, um, if you put additives into a conventional plastic, which is what OXO bio, biodegradable claims are about. They're not about novel materials. They're about an additive to a traditional plastic. Um, we've not seen evidence that this truly converts uh, those traditional polymers into being completely consumed by microorganisms. That's what, when we look at biodegradation in a composting environment, one of the core tests in our certification um, is looking at the organic carbon in a, in a polymer, and then uh, in a composting environment, how much uh, CO2 comes off of that as the microorganisms eat their organic carbon. And we can measure in scientific ways um, that that carbon is utilized as food, right? It's not just fragmenting, it's an invisible process. Uh, and for, you know, oxo biodegradation, photo, photo degradation, um, there may, there's something happening there, um, but it's not hitting that 90% threshold uh, that we need for, for compostability uh, or other true biodegradation claims in, in, our, in our views. And that's also why you see, you know, it also gets into this weird issue. If you look at OXO biodegradable claims, they traditionally are on items that are also claiming to be recyclable, um, which is something that we steer far away. We say we don't want to deal with anything that is widely recyclable. Again, we're not in competition with recycling, whereas the OXO biodegradable claims really verge into that, right? They're saying it's going to break down in a landfill. It'll break down if littered. It'll be recycled with your conventional plastics. And if you look at any of the big packaging and plastics groups, they all have statements saying, we don't want OXO biodegradable plastics. So the Association of Plastics Recyclers, the Plastics Industry Association, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you can just go down the list. They all have statements saying, please, no OXO biodegradable additives. Okay, uh, that's good clarification. The next one, uh, and this is another uh, sort of big one, home composting versus industrial composting. And, you know, what, what is materially, what uh, is the real, real difference? And, and is there a better or a worse? It's all about scale. So <clears throat> if you think about, I mean, realistically, composting um, is, is one thing. It's not like there is some magical difference between uh, backyard composting and commercial scale composting or between the different types of commercial composting technologies that can get you to compost. Um, but when you have a, a, a composting process, there is a, um, you know, there are temper there's a temperature arc where you go through a, a mesophilic, so or lower temperature um, profile to a thermophilic temperature back to mesophilic. Um, and this is able, this, there are different microorganisms that are active in those different temperature profiles. And the microorganisms are what are generating that heat, right? I think that's also a, a misconception. People say, well, how did you get, how, what's the source of that heat? Um, to get to those thermophilic temperatures, you know, 170 degrees. And it's like, no, the, the microorganisms are, are creating that heat. Um, and 
I think the difference with backyard composting versus commercial really has to do with that scale and that volume. If you don't have a lot of volume um, and you're not monitoring um, the, the parameters and conditions, so things like the carbon to nitrogen ratio or the moisture in the pile, that's a really big one, uh, or the porosity to make sure that there's airflow, that you don't go anaerobic and don't have enough oxygen, um, this can happen at a commercial scale facility, um, but it's much more likely to happen in your backyard bin because you're not a professional. You're not monitoring it every day. Uh, it's in this small, small space. And so very often you're not getting the high temperatures. It's, uh, you know, pretty un atypical to hit a thermophilic temperature in your backyard. Um, and so it's going to take longer. You know, the process of biodegradation in that composting pile in your backyard is going to take, you know, probably double the time that it would take in a commercial facility. Um, and because you're not hitting those high temperatures, some of the materials that we've uh, designed and certified as compostable are going to struggle to break down in those backyard systems because they really need um, that hyperactive uh, commercial composting environment with the higher temperatures, more agitation, uh, you know, uh, moisture that's really on, on spec. Um, and so those are probably the biggest differences. It's, 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 because it's a smaller scale, uh, and a smaller volume, you're going to struggle to get um, the right volume for, for temperature and likely you're not going to be monitoring things like moisture as closely as you would at a commercial facility. Yeah, like your parents, I've been working on uh, home composting for years and it's now I've ended up with this Lomi Pella, I'm sure you know that little machine and it's it, it's great, but obviously it's not, it's not, it's just doing a, uh, it's just doing a very quick job and, you know, relieving me of the challenge of turning the tumbler, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. so yeah, but I understand that. And I'm going to probably talk to you a little more about suboptimal composting after one more question, maybe. Um, sure. So the other one, which, which is very interesting, and again, I would love for you to throw light on, is that you can have, uh, and you mentioned it in passing, you can have uh, plant-based bioplastics and you can have petroleum-based bioplastics. Both can be bioplastics. Uh, and you can have plant-based bioplastics that do not break down, and you can have petroleum-based bioplastics that do break down. So where is it? Uh, so what, what, is, what is it according to you? So, you know, how does this all shape up and what is this uh, kind of the whole dichotomy between this plant and petroleum idea? Sure. And I, I think it all has to do with um, sustainability is a complex subject, right? It would be wonderful if uh, it was so easy and we said sustainability is X, right? If you just did these three things, uh, climate change wouldn't exist anymore, right? Um, you know, you would be, you meet the marker of the, of the ideal citizen of the world um, if you do these things. And I think that that's really what comes down to, right? Um, the term bioplastic is fraught, right? It, it, is a, it can mean many different things, as you just said. Uh, you can have plant-based inputs into something that is chemically identical to PET, right? That you can um, still recycle, has no uh, uh, negative impacts on the quality of that PET um, or other types of conventional plastics that can be recycled. And you see this most notably with the plant bottle, um, you know, in, at uh, Coca-Cola or uh, the uh, Heinz ketchup bottle, and you, you know, consumers may see this, uh, these claims um, where they've replaced some of the building blocks that go into that plastic uh, with plant-based inputs. Um, it's still traditionally recyclable. It's not compostable or biodegradable in, by any means. Um, and then, yeah, on the flip side, not all compostable plastics are made 100% from plant-based materials. And I think the, the way to sort of break it down is that it's all about carbon, right? Um, and uh, carbon is a basic building block and you can structure that carbon into a variety of things, right? And a variety of durability, of compatibility for recycling or for composting. Um, and that carbon can come from different sources. And the origin of that carbon um, is not what is determining whether it's recyclable or whether it's compostable. It's really how, you, how it's structured um, and the systems in which it's put in. If you go back to a systems-based approach, uh, I think this is where the human mind, right? You know, we're, we're so innovative, um, but we frequently look at just one part of the, the, um, the value proposition, right? And this is a classic example. I think, you know, we hear, um, you know, a lot of concern about, well, what, if, what do you mean? Compostable plastics aren't 100% plant-based? It's like, yeah, well, you're looking at just one small issue, right? Look at the broader issue around packaging. Um, the origin of the carbon is just one, right? Finite materials being extracted. 
there are all these all these other broader problems um, that are completely unrelated uh, to the origin of the carbon in terms of sustainability. Uh, to get materials collected and successfully recycled or composted and turned back into uh, desirable inputs. Um, so it is for sure confusing. And I think um, that's the simplest way that I could put it is carbon comes from a lot of things and even fossil based materials, you know, they came from plant based carbon, plant and animal carbon just a long time ago. So it's still carbon. Um, and, you know, a lot of things that are able to be produced at scale, this is part of the packaging problem more broadly, right, is it's a global economy. And the way that packaging has become so efficient and so uh, affordable, right, having a small impact on the cost of the, the food or other items that are in that packaging is the scale of, of um, production for these materials. Um, and so for sure, compostability is moving towards uh, more and more towards plant-based inputs. And the majority of them have a high percentage of plant-based input. Um, but one of the things we, you know, pr practice at BPI is really focusing on that system and saying, don't get too, don't get too caught up over there, right? This is that's important, but it's it's one piece of the whole of the whole puzzle. Super interesting, and that I think very well takes me back to our first one, which was the recycling idea. So this has been, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea of recycling again just seems to be a misnomer because because it's ultimately downcycling. Ultimately, you know, you're trying to take something and you keep downcycling it till a point when it doesn't downcycle anymore. Um, also what I see, and you've mentioned it uh, in a few of the articles that you've written, uh, is the idea of local versus, you know, this big supply chain, you know, where, you know, uh, the, the whole waistline is, uh, is maybe collected in the United States, it's shipped all the way to Vietnam or China or India. And, and it's, you know, taken up upland and again, you know, recovered 50% or whatever, and then again, shipped back. And that's quote unquote, recycling, or I would call it downcycling. So, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts on this idea of recycling versus what, what I feel it is like downcycling. And of course, the impact of local versus this whole global supply chain that is needed. And, and what are your thoughts on both of these, please? Sure. I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer the question about downcycling. I, you know, I'm, I'm aware that it happens a lot. Um, and but I'm not I'm not the expert on why exactly that is happening. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, what can be done to um, improve the ability of a material to be recycled multiple times back, in, you know, into uh, a, a similar quality of application. Um, and I know that there's a lot of fraught discussion around chemical recycling or molecular recycling as one of the ways to possibly um, address that, right? Being able to break down <clears throat> plastics into their core elements and use those as new building blocks. But there's a whole, you know, um, upset about, you know, well, what's the pollution that goes into that chemical recycling? Uh, what if it actually goes back into fuel in, instead of into plastics? Um, but I think that there, you know, there, there's definitely a lot of work being done on that. And, I, and, you know, I'm happy to chat with you about some people who I think are really digging into that and trying to understand why um, so much downcycling happens today um, and how, how you improve that. I think that the, the part that I can really answer is um, this aspect of composting and how that is, is different, right? Um, and when we think about it, um, food scraps and composting are, are a wet, uh, heavy, putrescible, meaning they, they're quick to rot material. Uh, and by its very nature, the, the raw ingredients um, are not going to be shipped overseas the way other packaging waste streams are. Um, even once you've completed the composting process, uh, finished compost is still pretty heavy um, and it's not going to be sh you know, shipped, uh, for the most part, not shipped overseas, right? It's a material that is um, best handled locally and, and regionally. Um, and I think that that's what's really exciting about compostable packaging in that connection is you start to break some of these uh, these chains that you're seeing, right? Some of these issues of the global supply chain of, of packaging where plastic packaging in particular is collected, it's sorted, it's bailed, it's sent overseas where maybe it's further sorted, uh, maybe it's burnt, um, maybe it's released into uh, the waterways, uh, uh, they're maybe a whole separate economy of waste pickers, um, you know, picking through things. And I think what's exciting about um, that food scraps and composting and compostable packaging element is suddenly you have this set of packaging 
um, that is collected with the local waste stream. It's not being, it's not going to make sense to uh, clean those compostable packaging items and ship them overseas. They're, by their very nature, they're collected with the food and composted. They don't need to be separated. By the end of the process, they're, they're, they shouldn't be there. Um, and so I think that's really exciting. And, and um, because we're really focused on uh, redesign of particular unique items and items that make sense in a, in a particular geography, we're also able to start seeing a, a, a regeneration of old um, conversion sites, old factories. And this dates back to my Nofamont days. And one of the cool things that um, I got to see happening in, in Italy where you know, the country prioritized composting um, and started rolling out curbside composting programs. Novamont was a large player in the development of compostable materials and flexible materials like bags. Um, the country also said, we, like many places, we want to get rid of single-use shopping bags. You know, they're leaked into the Mediterranean. Uh, they blow around in their litter. Um, but a compostable alternative to the bag is okay. And why did they do that? Well, um, for a lot of reasons. Um, one is, again, too many reusable bags suddenly becomes it's kind of an environmental problem. Uh, if you have 1,000 reusable bags in your house, is that actually sustainable? Um, for sure, you should have reusable bags, use them, um, but occasionally you might forget them or you might have uh, an extra couple items of groceries um, you know, that you don't need to buy another reusable bag for. So a compostable bag fits into this situation because it's a much lower impact to produce that bag um, and it can be used to, as a tool to collect your food scraps. And so what happened was this um, big push for more composting, a big push to get rid of uh, single-use plastic shopping bags, but exempting compostables, making this connection with ad campaigns for people saying, this is a tool, right? It's not a, a regular shopping bag. This is a tool to collect your food scraps. Um, and being able to see the regeneration of factories in, in Italy that had become outsized, right? They were too small um, to, to continue producing com, um, shopping bags. All that had been outsourced to Asia, right? Um, to bigger factories where you could do it more efficiently. It didn't make sense to make shopping bags in Italy for, for the Italian market. Um, but now you're able to regenerate that because you need a smaller number because you've already banned most shopping bags. It's a small number that, uh, of compostable bags that you actually need. Um, you know, just the ones in addition to your reusables. And so you're producing the material uh, locally as, as Novamont, and then you're finding converters who are making the bags locally and you're re revitalizing a local economy. So I think that that's this other aspect. It's not just that you're not shipping uh, organics and compostable packaging in the global plastics uh, after economy. You're also able to pr potentially revitalize um, and bring some of that production capacity uh, for finished items into domestic soils, into local communities. And I could see that happening in developing countries and island nations uh, where it's really hard, right? So maybe you have to bring in the raw materials, but you could convert it into the shopping bags and make the specific number that you need for your, for your food scraps uh, to collect for composting. Super interesting. And of course, there's this other question, and I'm sure you sort of uh, deal with it in one way or the other, is, is this challenge of process and production. You know, you can have a very green material at the end, but are you using a greener process? Because many times it may be better to, you know, uh, produce a, in the scheme of things, it may be even better to produce a non-compostable substance while, you know, the, the whole process is so much lighter. So I don't know if, if that's something that you, that you come across and you dwell on. Yeah, I try not to dwell on it um, for the very reason that I think at the core of that thought, right, is the best, uh, the best solution is to use less, right? So going back to my, my saying of, you know, growing up on a, on, on a rural farm in Pennsylvania with Buddhist uh, practicing parents, right? And um, this concept of voluntary simplicity, right? A simple, simple life. So I think that um, yeah, do, doing, doing with, uh, more with less. Right. And, um, I think that a lot of the issues, when you look at like a life cycle analysis, um, comparing a compostable plastic to, uh, a conventional plastic or plastic versus paper, um, the compostables, you know, they're produced in, on much smaller scales, right? They have not been produced for the 50 plus years that conventional plastic has. Um, they've got a much, yeah. Um, it's less efficient when you do things on a smaller scale. And they're targeting a really specific section of um, 
of the composting and packaging world, right? We're not trying to um, replace all plastics and saying that, you know, again, the number one problem is that the plastic wasn't compostable. Let's just make it all compostable. Um, if that were the case, then yeah, we'd have to have those LCAs buttoned down and show, you know, scalability is no problem. Once we hit the scale of polyethylene, we'll have the same environmental impact. Um, but I think that, yes, of course, we need to be mindful of all of the um, other aspects of producing single-use items. Uh, when you produce things on a small scale um, and when they're new materials, you, you might not be as efficient uh, as, as the, the incumbent material. Um, and so I just try to encourage people when they get stuck on that and they're focusing on these LCAs to say, okay, to, you know, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Like, you know, we're, we're, things are getting better. And if you just look at some of the early studies on PLA, for instance, compared to the newer studies on PLA, as the scale has grown and the efficiency has changed, um, the LCAs are dr drastically improving. And we have some information about that on our website. Yeah, I think I think that's so true because it's it's a journey, right? Plastic has been around for seventy, eighty odd years, and you know this is a this is just ramping up the whole bioplastics and the compostable packaging kind of segment. So I think you're right. It, it's if you get too stuck on the idea of uh, process efficiency, then we may lose the end objective, and that's why. So I'm going to I'm going to make a little bit of a switch towards uh, other questions around. Uh, the, the certification network and uh, and things like that, where you know when we look at the globe, ultimately the 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 idea is the same that you know go towards a zero waste, cleaner kind of planet. But uh, the whole certification mechanism is is different. It's diverse. You can have the European OK Home Compost, and you have separate standards in India, and then of course you you US is mostly BPI. Uh, so is there any talk of a common global standard? How do you see it? Is it a possibility of having that so that we move as singular citizens of this planet rather than having separate uh, certifications in every country? And of course, it adds to the cost of a manufacturer as well. How do you see it? And maybe there is already think a think tank or thinking around that idea. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question and, and one that... Um... For sure, we think about a lot and talk with our, our member companies on our board of directors who, you know, a lot of them are, are global companies. Um, and I think, yeah, we do at BPI, we do whatever we can to um, harmonize with other certifiers um, and other bioplastics groups to make it as easy as possible uh, to reduce uh, duplicate testing. Um, and we do have, yeah, calls. Uh, I wouldn't say they're regular yet, but we do have calls, international calls um, of the different bioplastics groups and certifiers um, to really identify uh, trends, um, try to identify common language uh, and requirements. And so I, I, we, are, we are working on that and trying to figure out what, it, what does that system look like? Um, you know, could we get to a point where there's a universal application um, used around the world? Um, and, you know, what are the... What are the core requirements um, and what are some of the differences and why do those di did those differences come about? Uh, and so I think that's what's interesting, right? If you look at the um, compostability standards around the world, the core tests and the core pass-fail requirements are all the same. Um, where things get a little different is, is in the weeds, right? Um, so for instance, should there be additional plant toxicity testing with earthworms? Uh, that's a requirement uh, out of Australia. Um, should we ban PFAS, uh, you know, a persistent uh, chemical? That became front and center for us before it did for the other certifiers, right? We, were, uh, that we started tackling that shortly after I was hired and had a resolution in 2017 um, banning PFAS. Um, and so those are some of the differences. And a key one is heavy metals. Um, so heavy metals are regulated in the standards, and they're linked to um, regulations that exist in those countries or those regions, and they vary differently. Uh, so in the U.S., our heavy metals requirements are linked to uh, the EPA um, sewage sludge heavy metal limits, so biosolids um, you know, processing. Um, and so they tend to be a little bit easier to pass than uh, the Canadian heavy metals limits or European heavy metals limits that are linked more directly to food and yard trimmings compost. Um, and so 
there are international standards. ISO um, has some international standards and, you know, more or less, right, they try to detail, right, that, that what the different metals requirements are per country so that you can tailor uh, your claim and your certification to that specific um, need. And I think this is where the dialogue is sort of headed, right, is it's really important to have uh, global standards and tests that we all align on. Um, it's important to have technical reviewers doing, you know, the, the scientific assessment in the certification, which we outsource um, to, a, to an accreditation body, a techn accredited technical body. Um, but then you also need the, the local or regional group that really understands the market demands and needs. Um, so if you look at our requirements, right, besides PFAS, um, we've added all these other requirements on top of meeting the ASTM standards for compostability. We have really strict eligibility criteria. Uh, where the item has to be associated with food and yard trimmings. We don't certify um, conventional e-commerce packaging or sneakers, uh, things like that. Um, the item can't be widely recycled, so we won't certify water bottles uh, or be beverage bottles. Uh, those are a, a, a coveted item for recycling, um, and it could confuse consumers and upset composters. Um, the item can't be disassembled, um, need to be disassembled, so you can't certify something that you'd have to take apart in order to compost. Uh, we require that the item be labeled. It can't be an unmarked item. That's pretty unique for us, too. As we deal with contamination concerns in the U.S., um, composters are really concerned that they, after all that effort of developing and certifying and marketing and selling a compostable product, if it's completely unmarked, how is anyone going to know what bin to put it in? And so BPI has taken that hard step of uh, adding more staff, um, complicating our certification process to do artwork reviews at every level on product, uh, market facing packaging, consumer facing packaging to make sure um, that the compostability claim is, is actually showing up. And so I think that the long winded answer is yes, we are talking and we're trying to figure it out from sort of these core levels of um, how do we reduce unnecessary testing? Um, how can we collaborate and potentially not have people recertify the technical aspect and focus this on this aspect of the, the regional or country specific requirements? It's good to hear that there is talk of uh, collaboration because I know that, uh, you know, when we talk to, especially to smaller companies and startups, it becomes a big challenge for them to have okay home compost in Europe and, you know, pay a certain thousands of dollars there and then come to US and then go to Australia and, you know, have these multiple. And like you said, they're very similar tests. There may be a few things here and there, uh, like you talked about metals and toxicity. And uh, and again, Europe will have their own and so would Australia. Uh, but then, you know, like uh, those are relatively minor differences in, in my understanding. Uh, and uh, and it'll be great if, uh, if especially, especially for smaller companies, if there was a common global standard that could be evolved. And it's good to hear you say that there is at least talk and I hope, you know, there'll be more collaboration between the agencies. But I guess uh, from a from a from a manufacturer's perspective, it's also a way to keep these agencies alive, right? If there's one global standard, how do you share revenues? Or is that the case or not really the case? Sure, there is a, a revenue perspective, but I think, um, you know, I, from the perspective of the association, at least from our side, right? We're, we're a nonprofit. Um, so if what we resolved on uh, was something that uh, took away our revenue because it made things more efficient for the companies using our services, um, that, would be, that would be okay, right? Um, so I think that that is part of this broader discussion, um, you know, is what are the business models of of these organizations? Um, are they nonprofits whose mission is to support, promote the production use and appropriate end of life of materials like BPIs? Or is there a, a you know, a profit uh, incentive um, that makes it really hard to reduce uh, testing and collaborate and share? Um, so I, I do foresee that being part of the tension as we move forward. But I think that because you have a lot of um, sort of core uh, global companies producing the raw materials. Uh, we call them the ma material producers. Uh, we have a committee of material producers at BPI focusing on topics like this, right? That they have common in common around the world. Um, and so I do think that we'll be able to work through that because again, you're going to need the local, the local group who understands 
uh, the dynamics of the marketplace. So a BPI in the US, uh, a European bioplastics, a Korean bioplastics, J Japanese bioplastics group, um, we're not gonna be able to do away with all of those local associations. But the, the aspect that you're talking about, the standards, the tests uh, to, to those standards and the, the certification that you've met those base standards, that should be something that we can align on as a global thing. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful with that. And I, and I think that from our perspective, again, that's okay. We, we outsource all of that today anyway. Um, really what we want is to make sure that companies selling their products into the US are doing it responsibly um, and are contributing to um, you know, an industry association that is actually gonna advocate for b good policies um, and that they're not just, again, sort of latching onto compostability because it's some green thing um, that they heard about uh, and dumping their products into the marketplace like any other green claim. Um, and I think that's where, where the value is that we bring, um, is we're able to sort of connect all those dots along the supply chain. Um, and to us, simplifying what tests are done and who's doing the review of those tests is all, is all, all positive, no negative. No, and that's wonderful. I, I do hope that in the future there will be common testing agencies, and you're right, and you can have different certificates from those same so the same tests can be recognized and then certified by others. So this this uh, makes me jump into this. Uh, you mentioned PFAS, and PFAS has, of course, been this hot topic of conversation. And particularly, somebody was even asking us about the products we produce and, you know, how how uh, focused are we on PFAS? So he said, yes, we are working on it. But since we don't sell that much in the U.S., it's not that much of a concern because Europe and India so far have not pushed for PFAS. So I want to understand more about this because it's become a huge concern in US and I know BPI has been very vocal about it and clear about it that there is no way that uh, even, you know, even, even what is it, some parts in million is 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 visible in terms of PFAS. So, so it'll be great to learn more about the idea of PFAS and why it makes uh, BPI so uh, clear that, you know, this is not something they're ready to accept. And one of the questions that I did ask you and we met a few years back, five years back, was that what would you, like, what is the alternate? If you say that I'm not going to allow the molded fiber with, certain amount of oil proofing chemical which has some sort of uh, part of PFAS which may or may not get into the food versus a plastic you know so would you would you go back to a styrofoam so you know so so so, the, so two part question uh, instead of this long winded winded uh, uh, idea is that the ideas around PFAS and what does it mean and then what is the alternate would you rather go back to styrofoam or plastic or something like that Um, I'll start with the second one first. I, there was a lot of concern, right? Um, that with BPI sticking our neck out on the line and banning PFAS that, um, there'd be a rollback, uh, to styrofoam and, and, and some of our companies, you know, threatened that to me, right? Saying you're going to be responsible for companies, uh, readopting styrofoam, you know, how is that going to make you feel? And, you know, my answer to that is, look, it's, it's all a learning curve. And um, the way that we've approached, the way I, I've approached to some of these big changes that BPI has made, uh, where we come out in front of a topic ahead of a lot of other certifiers, um, it, because we're really becoming an advocacy group. And it's an uncomfortable position. That's why a lot of you don't see other um, certifiers and, and bioplastics groups doing what we're doing. Um, and it's a tension because we, we have company, our members, we're a member-based organization, right? Our, our dues come from members. We don't write grants. Um, and so a traditional trade association would never do something like the things that we're doing where we say, uh, you know, we're going to ban something that you're using. Um, you know, trade associations typically defend, right, what their members are doing. And what we said is, well, hold on a second. We're a trade association, but we're, we're a mission-driven association. And if you look at our mission, um, we, we have to follow that mission. And if there's something that is not essential to compostability, right, if it were a, a question of microplastics and the science of biodegradation, um, BPI w w would fight that to its death, right? Right. With PFAS, 
it, it's not something inherent to compostability, right? It's not a, a compostable um, mo uh, monomer or polymer, right? That has been developed for compostability. Um, it's in there by accident, right? For compostability. Um, it's not something that aided compostability. And so, um, of course, I don't want people to go back to, uh, you know, other uh, single-use items that have to be landfilled. Um, if in certain cases there is no PFAS-free alternative, um, I do think switching to a, a recyclable uh, takeout container is probably the better solution, right? Um, rather than a PFAS-laden molded fiber product because PFAS is one of those topics that it's, it's so ubiquitous in the environment. Um, you know, I don't think that PFAS in compostable products is a significant contributor to PFAS globally in any sense or a significant contributor to PFAS in a compost facility. Um, but that's not really the point, right? Because if composters and municipalities and governments and businesses who are developing these food scra scraps programs and relying on compostable products for that program to work in many cases, you know, you think of a stadium or a campus, you know, they're, they're not able to go back to a food scrap only program. They, they need the compostable products to make that program work. If they can't trust um, that the compostable product uh, is safe, right? That if they think that it is a, a contributor and could be leading to PFAS in the compost pile, um, suddenly that, that, that trust in, in the value of compostability more broadly goes away because composters are being regulated and asked to test. Is there PFAS in their finished compost? Is there PFAS in their contact water? And again, there is. There's almost always gonna be PFAS in them. And by taking PFAS out of compostable products, I don't think there's gonna be a measurable change. But what the change is, is composters and governments and businesses can trust that we're not a contributor to that. And wherever the PFAS is coming in, whether that's from the air, because it's in the dust, um, whether it's in the rainwater, because now they're saying rainwater in many places is not safe to drink because of PFAS, the groundwater contaminated by PFAS, um, food service products that are not compostable, you know, certified compostable, right? Uh, fast food packaging um, that is food soiled, but not compostable. Suddenly we've eliminated, right, ourselves from that huge bullseye that is just growing bigger and bigger around the panic of, of PFAS. And we were just said, you know, a few years back saying at first, to be very clear, at first, when I heard about this, I was only on the job for less than a year. And I was like, this doesn't really sound like BPI's problem, right? Like um, it's in almost no compostable products, right? Most of them use bioplastics or waxes for a grease barrier. It's just this one category of molded fiber products. And we're not the EPA, we're not the FDA, to your point, like we don't know if it's transferring to food. The studies I've seen for a molded fiber product, it doesn't transfer to the food. But as we talked about it with governments and with composters, they were like, that's not the point. What about our compost? Um, and what about the impact on our business? And if you think about the plant toxicity tests and the heavy metals tests, right? At the end of the day, what those are, are to show that there's no negative impact um, on the quality of the compost. You know, we, our products go in and we're saying, this isn't gonna, your compost is still gonna be able to have the same wonderful effect to germinate and, and fertilize uh, crops. You're not gonna be uh, flagged for heavy metals and not be able to sell your compost or sell it at a lower, lower grade. Um, and we wanted to just, we wanted to add PFAS to that list to make sure that um, composters could trust, trust the products. That's, Does that make sense? I know that's it, a hard one. Yeah, it is a hard one. And I can see it from your perspective. It's like, it's literally, it's literally like you don't want to be in a place where a finger is pointed to the compostable packaging. And which is, which is so interesting because, you know, these are the dynamics. This is the systems thinking again, right? It may, like you're right. And that is my question normally as well, that is it transferring to the food? But like you said, and it's refreshing for me to hear, to get your perspective, that it's not about that. It's about, you know, just on, and you're right, like many, I've heard like PFAS is in water. So, you know, so what are we talking about when we're talking about a molded food container? But now I understand your thinking where you do not want a finger pointed to a certain kind of compostable. You, you're trying to protect it that far out that, you know, the composters cannot say that, you know, uh, this one has PFAS and hence we won't take it. So, you know, you're sort of eliminating that idea, right? Sure, because they, they don't know that it's just molded fiber, right, that had it. It could have been in everything, right? And there was no way for us to be able to um, to really talk about that. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, I think it's just really challenging. And I, I think we, um, 
we wanted to basically, when we heard these arguments about no transfer of the food, we, that was early on. And, and we were like, yeah, we're not the FDA, right? Um, and even with these, the first discussions around um, toxicity in the environment, right? Whether that was uh, primarily that was originally focused on in the end of life in the compost. And we were saying, well, again, like, why, how is this our issue? Like, we, PFAS is coming from everywhere. And then also we learned, okay, well, a lot of the releases are from, at the manufacturing sites. Well, if our members are purchasing it, they're supporting the manufacturing sites that are the you know huge these, these huge release sites, um, and so we're basically saying, look, we don't think we're going to solve the problem by any means, but if we remove ourselves from that and just say, look, we we don't want a part of this. We don't want to show that we are supporting the production of these things and the release at the production sites. Um, and yeah, we're not the FDA, we're not the EPA, but these materials right from the Floral Council's website say that they are very persistent, they cannot be broken down, and that they're mobile in water, and composting is a, is a wet process. Um, and so we just sort of use these very narrow lines um, to say, here's evidence that it impacts the quality of the compost, and some composters who specifically said it, it costs them more money if there's PFAS in their, their water or their compost, and said, we're not getting into the human or health uh, toxicity issue, we're not getting into food contact, um, we're just saying it negatively impacts the quality of the compost. Yeah, super interesting. The the, the dynamics of, uh, of of systems uh, in general. Uh, so, so switching a little bit uh, and and being cognizant of time uh, is uh, is how do you see? Ultimately, you need a lot of scale in the composting side, and how do you see uh, that happening? And of course, I'm sure that is something that's high on your agenda. And uh, and how do you want that to evolve uh, going forward in terms of collection? or rather going for separation, collection, and then composting, and we'll come to the market side of it after that. Sure. And this is why I think I like what I do uh, most days, is that um, predominantly what we're talking about, again, it, it's not um, access to recovery for packaging. Um, it's access to... Um, collection and processing for food scraps and yard trimmings in which compostable packaging can also be included, right? And I think that that's what's really exciting. It's also what makes the problem very daunting because for recycling, if you look at something like extended producer responsibility programs, um, where you shift the cost of collection and processing um, from communities to the company producing the packaging, um, and in those extended producer responsibility programs, EPR, um, for recycling, it's, it's not a clean system by any means, it's not simple, but um, it's fully funded or shared, the funding is shared, and it's all about the collection of packaging in a cart, going to a facility that is dedicated to managing that packaging. For composting, it's not really like that. We're working really hard to get EPR, compostability included in, in EPR programs um, and in bills. So far, we're, we're two for f uh, out of four in the US out of uh, states have included composting in their EPR legislation. Um, and that helps us get part of the way there, right? It gets, it gets us to, if there's composting infrastructure, how do we incentivize and help fund the cost of handling packaging in addition to food scraps and yard trimmings? So I think that's part of the, the solution, right? Is, and, and the packaging connection. Um, what's daunting is the EPR for composting, right? Packaging can't pay for a, a national network of um, collection bins for food scraps and yard trimmings. Um, and so I think that um, that's what's exciting about it too, is we've started to spend a lot more time on um, the education and advocacy aspect of the system um, for compostability, which means you know going to the federal government or to state governments and advocating for universal access to food scraps composting. Um, and you know we do that. Yeah, I've done helped on that on the state level. Uh, both California and Washington State have uh, requirements that all jurisdictions have to offer organic waste collection to businesses and households. Um, and it's all based on uh, short short-lived climate pollutants. Um, so mitigating that methane in the landfills. Um, and now it's our job, right now that those are in place, to make sure that we incentivize um, packaging being included. Um, we've gone to the federal government and advocated for uh, $2 billion of grants and loans last year for food scraps composting. Didn't, didn't pass. Um, and this year supported um, federal bills. In, had, had the uh, for, fortune to be able to testify in person at the Senate 
um, in support of a, a federal recycling and composting accountability act um, to really start to piece apart like what's what's behind um, the system needed for recycling and composting at a federal level you know how many collection programs exist um, what are the barriers to these collection programs and processing infrastructure and end markets um, and I you know I'm I'm feeling positive um, I think I'm I share your your uh, dangerous optimism you know I I'm optimistic that um, people are realizing, right, the, the two, these two separate issues. What they haven't realized is how they connect yet, but they, they're recognizing the huge packaging problem, right, with more and more packaging public policy. And slowly there's more and more recognition of, of methane in landfills and uh, curbside access to programs. Um, you know, the fact that if, if uh, food waste and loss were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world after the U.S. and China. It's like, your mind explodes when you start thinking about that and you tell that to um, politicians and they're, they're like, wait, what? Like f food waste and loss is, is one of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters in the world. Um, and you can see them, you know, making that connection, right? So I, I'm optimistic that we're going to get there. Um, it's going to take a variety of mechanisms at the state level and the federal level for composting to get that access for, for food scraps and co uh, composting, both curbside drop-off programs, um, incentives for backyard composting and like trainings and free bins, which we're already seeing some cities like Austin do, uh, where they have curbside programs and they um, help support you uh, learning how to be a backyard composter and, and give you a um, money towards a backyard bin. Um, and then on this other side, the packaging side, you know, making sure that the packaging companies are um, helping support the costs uh, for that extra burden of handling packaging. Yeah, that's good to hear because I, I saw your testimony on the federal side and it was so it was just happiness for me to see that at least, uh, you know, they're listening. So so that's that's a big thing uh, on its own. And my dream has always been, you know, it should in my lifetime, I want to see a single instead of uh, this idea of multiple uh, trash cans. I want to see a single trash can with all packaging, all food waste, all yard waste, getting into it and then just being uh, being composted. And you referred to it and then I've read a beautiful, beautifully put uh, quote by you in one of the one of the articles that you wrote, uh, which was basically this, it's a loss of resources by taking it to landfill and uh, to incinerators. And it'll be great to hear you talk about that because I also feel that ultimately this is energy. You're storing, you're, you're taking energy and wasting it and making it into methane or burning it and, and, and not, not getting that energy out. And coupled with that uh, is something you referred to early on and again in some of your writings is this idea of uh, anaerobic digestion and then composting and what is an ideal system according to you uh in terms of uh, taking this waste is it is it better to just compost it straight or is it better to take gas and make take methane and generate energy and then take the compost so those two ideas it'll be great to hear your views on those sure yeah no i appreciate it um yeah it's a, it's a incredibly sad loss of energy and uh, human human energy, uh, you know, actual yeah energy in terms of uh, inputs um, and shipping materials all around the world, you know, for food, only for it to be wasted. And there's some great little videos um, from the National Ad Council uh, showing that that happened for a strawberry. So not even you know international markets, just like a national a domestic strawberry market in the U.S. And, uh, you know, looking at the all that goes into growing this beautiful strawberry and picking it and washing it and packing it, sending it to a supermarket, then it gets picked out, you know, and it's brought home and it goes in the back of your refrigerator and then it gets covered in mold because it's in the back of the refrigerator and it goes into the trash after all of it. And so I think, you know, that's what just amazes me. It's like, yes, it's the methane in the landfill, but like, whoa, hold on a second. Look at all of that energy all of that money, um, billions and billions of dollars lost, right? Just looking at the economic side, um, even if you didn't care about the environmental or human aspect, like the, the billions of dollars spent growing and picking and processing and shipping and refrigerating food just to have it be wasted. Um, and so I think that's what is so in, in, you know exciting and inspiring to me. Um, and you know I think that uh, in terms of, what is the best path? I'd say, unfortunately, it's like uh, the sustainability is complex answer, right? 
there's no one size fits all. And I think that we're realizing that a lot um, in terms of curbside access, right? Curbside access is a, is a vital importance for, for recycling and composting. Um, but what's exciting for composting is it doesn't have to be just curbside access, right? You can have drop-off bins, um, and we've seen that successful in big cities like New York City, where they have, I forget how many, it's more than 30 uh, drop-off locations to take your food scraps. Um, and you can have uh, backyard composting. Uh, you can have subscription services. So all these cool businesses around the U.S., um, if you go to a company like Compost Now, which is, offers their own subscription service, uh, and you look at their website, they, they've cataloged all these other companies that are like them around the country that offer subscription services. And they're, they're happy to like promote each other. How, how cool is that, right? They're not competing. I mean, they are competing, but they like show what's happening around the world, uh, around the country. Um, and so I think that when it comes to like, what is the best solution, it, it's, it's all of the above. And for processing, you know, if you are collecting the materials, either curbside or in a drop-off bin, um, I think that sometimes it's going to make sense for that to go directly to composting um, and not anaerobic digestion. It's going to depend on the material stream. It's going to depend on, um, you know, how far that material is shipped, what is it mixed with, um, and uh, what are the economics in that particular place in terms of energy economy, right? In some places, maybe there are a lot of other renewable uh, uh, energy sources um, that are going to drive down that, the, the, the value or the price. Um, and it might not make sense to do anaerobic digestion. So I don't know, thinking about like the Pacific Northwest, if you've got a lot of uh, hydropower um, and renewable energy is there's a big sor source for it, I don't know, renewable anaerobic digestion may be harder to justify there um, compared to Vermont, um, you know, some, some place like that that has an incentive program right now for uh, primarily farm digesters um, and good, you know, um, incentives for converting that into energy. And I think that um, the other complicating factor there about does anaerobic digestion always work uh, in concert and should it be with a uh, aerobic composting? Um, you know, I'm a firm believer in compost. I think that the purpose of anaerobic digesters is to generate energy, methane. It's focused on that. It's not focused on um, high quality inputs of the magic of compost. Can you turn it into a valuable fertilizer on its own? Yes, don't get me wrong. But I, I think that, you know, taking that digestate mixing it with some fresh yard trimmings. Um, the yard trimmings don't generate a lot of methane, so they still have to be processed. Um, keep them for the back end, uh, compost the digestate with that yard trimmings, and you get the best of both worlds. And for compostable packaging, um, you know, it's still an evolving thing. How does that work, right? Part of it depends on the pre-processing at the digester. Um, does it screen out everything that looks like packaging? Does it need to be a homogenous slurry, you know, wet uh, material, like a farm digester for manure? Packaging might not work so well in there, right? Does that mean that we shouldn't have compostable packaging, which is what some people pontificate? I'm like, no, hold on a second. There's, there's a lot of liquid food waste and manures that should go to those systems, right? They're lower cost. Um, those materials should go in there. It, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all, like this is the perfect thing. And I think humans, you know, we love to like think, oh, we found the one solution and now this is the only thing. Everyone has to do this. Um, and I just feel like, that's a little uh, short-sighted. Um, and for sure, it's going to make sense. There are communities that are figuring out how to send curbside organics into a digester with packaging and composting that digestate. It's just new, and it's, what works in one place isn't, isn't going to work everywhere. Yeah, super interesting. I wish there was one solution, and we would all be, <laughs> it would all be great, and uh, it's much easier. So, so just uh, another interesting question to do with scale and then and, and it's to do with scale at multiple uh, or rather three three broad uh, levels first is uh, creating scale in compostable packaging do you see that happening because the size of the challenge is huge you know when you look at petroleum based packaging then and that couples well with uh, scale of acceptance uh, by the by the and i know that bpi also works with with the, with the brands and the and the users uh, so that they are they are sort of encouraging more people to get into it and of course you know initially it may even mean a little bit of increase in price and how do you see that happening will they be accepting of that because i do see that they are now ready to accept a compostable packaging product if it is more or less at the same price. So, so that's the second part. And the third part is that of composting infrastructure that needs scale because many times, like uh, I'm told as a compostable packaging 
producer ourselves is that okay you can produce all the compostable packaging but it's still ending up at the landfill because you know there's not enough uh, infrastructure anywhere and people are not going to all home compost so so that those are the arguments that i hear so yeah so so how do you see this scalability in terms of resource materials raw materials to make compostable packaging scalability in the acceptance in the marketplace uh, so that in bulk, large companies are actually converting, not just talking about it. And the third is, of course, the, it's the cycle and then the composting infrastructure to enable that to happen. Wow, great. <laughs> uh, I think you've outlined it well, right? Um, and, you know, in the ideal world and using history uh, with our perfect vision looking back, I think it'll be interesting to see if we think that it all lined up, right? Um, and I think, again, just like there's a, a, a tendency to look for the, the one and only perfect solution, um, I think that there's a tendency to feel like if one thing is developing faster or slower than another, um, that we're doing it wrong, right? And, and um, I get that, right? People don't want to feel duped or... or um, Feel like they've invested a lot of time and energy into something uh, for nothing. Um, but again, I think that's why when we think about it from a systems perspective and not a product-based perspective, right? Because if you think about it on a, as a product-based solution, right, which is the traditional way of thinking about it, it's a, the, the solution to recycling is changing the product, right? Like, let's just, I don't know, switch out the format um, and suddenly the problem is solved, right? Like, um, make sure that the label doesn't get in the way of recycling. Now that product is recyclable. It's like, well, okay, yeah, that's part of it, you know, but um, I think, you know, I tell people, because people ask me that sometimes, like, like you're saying, oh, well, should I be buying a compostable product even if I have to put it in a landfill? You know, they, they love to ask um, BPI questions like this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll say, well, if that, you're thinking about it from a product-based perspective, right? Like, like, like this product is gonna solve your problems. Like, like you could take your wallet into a store and by spending an extra dollar, you, you've solved the problem. And, and I tell them that's not, how, that's not how it works, right? Like that's not how sustainability works. You have to make true changes. Um, uh, I was interviewed for an article uh, last year um, that ended up being this really short profile in a, um, a major news publication about green garbage bags. And, um, the, first, the reporter was great. She invested so much time talking to me um, about like how I was like, there is, th that, that's not a thing. Like good for the environment is, is not a, a claim for a, any product, much less a garbage bag, right? Like you have to think about what problem are you trying to solve here? Um, you know, is the garbage, you know, it started with like the OXO biodegradable garbage bag. And I was like, no, that's not really solving a problem. Um, does that, is the garbage bag have recycled content? Okay, you're displacing virgin content. All right, that, you know, that's, that, there's some benefit there. Is it, does it have bio-based input? That could be good. Um, for food scraps, right? It's not a compostable trash bag. It's a compostable food scraps bag, right? You're not putting your compost in a trash bag um, and sending it to the landfill. Um, and so I think those concepts, right, they're, they're kind of foreign to people. Um, and I think as they start to really understand that and you know, take a bite off and, and, and dig in, um, suddenly that cost difference becomes not so uh, life-threatening, right, in their decision. Um, and as they realize that all those scale scalability things don't have to line up perfectly, because, yeah, there are, like, fits and starts of, like, material shortages for the compostable products industry globally, right? Um, you know, the, the for years there was excess capacity uh, at factories, and now... Um, you know, people can't build the factories fast enough and upgrade them fast enough to keep up with um, creating the compostable products. And yeah, you hear composters um, and some sustainability people say, well, that's bad. You're, you're putting the cart way before the horse. You're producing all these compostable products, but uh, there's nowhere to put it. Uh, you know, there's no composting infrastructure. And we're saying, well, hold on a second. Th there is, you know, in the U.S., there are 10 million households that have access to curbside programs. There are 5,000 composting facilities. Only about 10% take food. Um, but you know, it's not like there's nothing happening. There, there is a lot happening. And it's one of those situations of like, uh, uh, um, of acting classes, right? Where you, it's, it's yes. And right. Like you, it's not an either or thing. Um, so that's where I come at it from that scalability. I, I don't know if I've answered all three facets, but yeah, we, we have to keep up with the production. Um, because 
the, wor the last thing we want is to have companies make the hard choices to switch to compostable products right at a venue, set up a whole composting program, and then not be able to get a compostable cup, right, or fork, um, and they have to swap out a conventional one, and then it contaminates the composting program, right? And then the composter says, this stuff doesn't work, you know, send it all to landfill. So, um, so you have to have enough supply. You have to, for sure, keep building out the infrastructure. And I think that the costs are coming down for consumers, and as consumers realize it's not just a green garbage bag, this is a tool, a totally separate tool, um, suddenly they're like, oh yeah, well, that makes sense, right? It's I don't need, it doesn't need to cost 10 cents a bag like a trash bag. It can cost, you know, more than that because it's not a trash bag. Now, to me, it makes perfect sense because I, I even look at it as a karmic obligation. Each one of us has their own dharmic karmic obligations where, you know, so me as a producer of compostable packaging, the aim is how do I scale this? How do I scale compostable packaging and maximize availability. And with that, I feel that, you know, there is a higher chance of somebody else seeing an economic value in taking that and making it into compost. And hopefully, you know, the one part which we haven't addressed, but is, is the market for compost. And hopefully the market for compost grows and there's an economic incentive for the composter to take more and more food scraps, more and more food packaging. Uh, into that same uh, stream. So that's the way I look at it. It's like we have to do our bidding and then hopefully there is somebody else who's going to do the other side of things and, and go along. And and that's, uh, yeah, so that's that's my comment on it. I'm happy to have, if you have another view on that and, and add on yeah, to just that, that thinking. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just that the only thing that I would say yes and to is, yes, you need to think about the scalability of your portion. And um, we all need to be involved in those other aspects, right, uh, of um, the development of the other aspects of the infrastructure. And I think, again, traditionally, you know, in the packaging world, um, not that I know much about the traditional packaging world, because I think I've always been focused on this other side, right? But it, it seems to me that the problems that we're seeing are this product-based approach, right? Where it's like, I need to improve my efficiencies, I need to meet local requirements, but, you know, curbside programs or upgrades to the material recovery facility, the MRF, like not really my problem. I hope that it works out and I hope that people figure that out, but I don't need to be invested in it. I think what, what's exciting is there's this shift now where people are, who are producing the products or using the products are getting involved in those other aspects. And I, I think, you know, we're seeing that, right, in terms of the market development things too. Like we're seeing more and more inv involvement from uh, compostable products companies in these laws that are developing requirements to collect food scraps for composting and helping amplify the message when composters are saying, well, what about the market? So if you look at um, SB 1383 in California, so specific law, uh, regulation, uh, the, the one that requires um, jurisdictions to make sure that all households and all businesses have access to organic waste collection, it also has a provision in there for um, for buyback of a certain percentage of compost. and. Um, and so to me, like, this makes sense. Like we can, we can do, start to fix a few things at the same time. You know, obviously I wish 1383 had some different things. I think the definition of organic waste in California should include compostable packaging, not just food scraps and yard trimming so that people have universal access uh, for the packaging associated with the food. Um, and, but I think for the most part, 1383, right? It got, it got a lot of those aspects right, right? It's making sure that people have access and making sure that the communities collecting that, um, those raw materials are also buying back a portion of the finished compost. Yeah, wonderful. So my second to last uh, question, and I think I alluded to it in my last uh, comment, is that ultimately, how does it become of an economic value proposition for a composter to actually uh, take this, uh, these materials and use it? Because as soon as, as, soon as it, it is economically beneficial, they will do it regardless of 1383 even. So, you know, so how do you foresee that happening? And I'm sure, you know, you guys as BPI would be thinking about that and working on it. Do you mean specific to uh, packaging or, or more broadly for food scraps and yard trimmings as well? I mean, holistically. I mean, ultimately there has to be enough of a compost market. So, so, so what I see is that many times there is not enough of a market 
for compost because people, again, like you referred to it again early on, uh, that people see it as a fertilizer. It's not just a fertilizer. It's it's way beyond being a fertilizer. It's soil itself, you know, and it's soil regeneration. Uh, so, so and then many times it's that's not appreciated enough i guess it's under, understood by farmers but not appreciated enough so 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 holistically if a compost uh, gets a good market and yes i think food scrap and compostable packaging would add value to that quality of compost uh, then there would be a higher economic benefit so how do you see that whole thing play out where there is a bigger market and a higher economics for compost Yeah, it's a good one. And I think that um, part of that is, you know, just like with recycling, I think, um, where it's partly like, what is the the business of recycling, right? How much um, is there just, how much can the sale of the finished recyclable materials, right? Because you're you, you sell that commodity on the back end, just like you sell compost on the back end. How much um, for recycling could that um, become the business model, right? That you were selling that those recyclable materials and there's enough value that um, we're not so reliant on the tip fee, right? Coming in, um, but there's always gonna be some inherent cost to um, to recycling uh, and to composting as a as a, you know, taking a waste stream. And I think that, you know, this is for sure a huge conversation. And we, we hear, you know, composters talk about this a lot that, you know, shifting the terminology and saying that they're compost manufacturers. Um, and that terminology comes from saying, we don't want to be treated like, like waste processors. Um, and I think it's really interesting because I totally respect that and obviously have a uh, immense see the immense value in compost and manufacturing high quality compost um but it is challenging right when you think about recycling and composting and the nature of collecting a material stream that um is not going to cannot go to other beneficial use right so you reduce the food uh you send edible food uh to humans who are in need uh food that can't go to humans but is still fit for consumption for animals can go to animals um you know, we don't want to be sending a lot of edible food to, to compost. So by its nature, it's there's, an, there's a cost to collecting that material. There's a cost of managing that material at a composting facility. Um, and just like there is with recycling for all of that. And so I think that is a really tough one. And, you know, we hear that a lot in California uh, in particular. And what's interesting is um, looking at the current dynamic and then trying to envision, like, what needs to change to improve it. And so if you look at uh, one of the last statewide assessments of compost infrastructure that was uh, funded by CalRecycle, the state recycling organization, um, they get into, uh, you know, the economics, how much compost processing infrastructure is there, how much more do they need, hint, a lot, um, to get to their goals uh, for universal composting. Um, and what are the, what's the dynamic uh, of the composting business model? It's, in California, it's 70 to 80% of the money is made on the tip fee, so the fee in, for incoming, only 20 to 30% on the sale of the finished compost. Now, that dynamic is going to change depending on where you are. And we know that in places where uh, landfill tip fees are much lower, um, composters are making the majority of their money on the finished compost. Um, and the tip fee is just barely covering, you know, some basic costs uh, for processing. And so, but I think that that's really fascinating. It's, it's, it's this concept of... Um, how do we uh, yeah, incentivize comp people to get into the business of composting? Just like how do we incentivize companies to get into the business of recycling um, when there's an inherent value for society uh, for these things, right? Um, and, I, and I think that we don't want to lose sight of that, right? That this is a, um, you know, maybe not to go too far, but it's, it's, it's could it be a universal right, right? Like the, a universal right to be able to have access to, the things that you've purchased or that have come into your home have a place to go, right? That don't need to be thrown in a landfill or littered. Like, I feel like that's a, a should be a universal right if we really had, I mean, there are a lot of other things that come before that around the world um, for sure. But I feel like that should be a universal right. If it's a universal right, we shouldn't rely on pure business model and economics to solve that because uh, 
Otherwise, I think we're going to be always in this weird, this weird ground of thinking that, oh, recycling and composting should be free. Just make your money selling this stuff on the other side. Um, I know that's not what you're suggesting. I, I just think that um, it's this dynamic of that tip fee, the, the generating a product that's worth something that can be sold. And um, I think historically, right, that's been one of the challenges for recycling. Those markets fluctuate wildly to the extent that recycling programs literally get canceled or they kick things out of the recycling program because there's no market for it um, for them to sell it. How horrible would that be, right? If like we were like, oh, well, the compost you know, markets, I mean, we have some new thing for soil amendments. Um, so I, being an optimist, I see a lot happening to improve that value of compost and, and um, the new Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we're not sure exactly what it's going to look like, but it has a lot of funding um, going to the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and some of that is around soil health. And um, so we're pretty excited that maybe some of that can be around, uh, you know, sort of in the line of the Kiss the Ground um, book and documentary uh, where, you know, you see the NRCS agents, um, you know, trying to help farmers figure out like, look, it's not just better for the environment. Like you don't have to be reliant on um, government subsidies. If you diversify what you're growing and you do no-till or low-till agriculture and you use compost, um, there are these other, other business opportunities. You can make way more money. Um, and so I'm excited uh, about that aspect. Yeah, totally. I, I, I agree with you. And I sort of have that different uh, perspective where, where I see, you know, as soon as there is, say, there's a plastic ban, quote, quote, unquote, the whole dynamic shift, there is this, the only thing we are thinking about even as an organization right now is how do we scale? Market is a non-issue now. So, 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 you know, so it's the similar thing here, like you mentioned, you know, like if there is more even legislation around soil amendments, then, you know, the composters have an automatic economic incentive. And I totally see your point of view where it's like a universal right. You know, there is some, everything has to have somewhere to go and somewhere good to go. So, so, you know, so both those things, I think, together maybe can make, you know, for our children at least, make a different uh, world in the future. Uh, so the last one, and thank you for taking this extended time. Uh, I know that we've gone a little bit over, uh, but uh, what is your thinking? What does good garbage mean to you? And how do you see that uh, in, in the coming times? Um, I, you know, I think that, I think that we're on the right trajectory. Um, globally, right? I obviously know more about the U.S. and Canadian market, but we talk to our uh, colleagues and our partners around the world. And I think that um, people are really interested in, in climate change and in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and how, uh, you know, thinking about waste uh, and how unjust uh, our waste culture is, right? It's besides all the things we've been talking about, we didn't really talk a whole lot about like you know, incinerators uh, typically are built in um, poor uh, and poor communities of people of color, right? Um, you know, this whole export economy, uh, you know, for, for waste streams around the world is reliant on these waste picker communities. Um, and I think that it's an exciting time to be um, working on these topics. And I think that generally the, the world is moving in the right direction, acknowledging um, the interconnectedness of what one country does and the impact on another country um, and the impact on one another, right? And, and the the need to make sure that, um, yeah, we're creating opportunities for everybody and we're not just swapping one problem for another. Uh, and you know, there are huge economic uh, impacts of uh, composting versus landfilling. Um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance has great statistics on that showing, you know, per ton of food, how many more jobs are created uh, if you compost that ton versus landfilling or incinerating it. And that's before you get into that aftermarket economy that you're talking about, you know, of like the compost is sold and then what, right? There are all these other jobs like associated with that, right? Green roof builders and turf dressing for on golf, uh, you know, courses and, um, you know, D Department of Transportation use, right? And once you develop all these markets for the finished compost, it's not just good for the composter, it's good for us as a society. Um, you know, as we move away from uh, fossil-based traditional industries, you know, in the energy economy, right? That's a, one of the big things is like, well, what's going to happen to those jobs? Um, 
you know, we're going to take jobs away from people if we stop mining coal. And it's like, well, hold on a second, like solar panels and all these other things, they, they take a lot of jobs too. And actually they're safer and pay better. Um, and so I think that that's pretty exciting to think about um, when I think about, uh, you know, the concept of good garbage. And I, and I think we're at a really awesome point um, where we're not, while we're in the early stages of compostable products and packaging development, um, we've got a leg up. It's not, we're not starting from zero. There are already, you know, really innovative products on the marketplace that I didn't think I would see um, back when I was at BioCycle. It was, they're pretty simple structures. And now we have like super complex items, right? Single use coffee pods, you know, um, that are in the, the regular uh, machines as well as the little espresso style one. Those things have to withstand super high heat and high pressure. It's amazing. I mean, that's a technical feat, right? That the coffee stays fresh, that it handles, can go into the conventional brewer, brewing device, you know, stand-in thing or flexible packaging that can, um, you know, hold our food and sit on the shelf for six months um, and is not raising the price of that food. I mean, that's, that's kind of remarkable and we're just seeing it scratch the surface. So I think that's what's pretty exciting when I think about good good garbage. Um, I think that we're we're already starting to see uh, the the work of all of that those early seeds that were planted, and I think it's just going to accelerate from here. It's it's just so wonderful to hear you talk, uh, Rhodes, because uh, because I think it's it's the optimist in you, and it's wonderful to hear that because you, I guess, deal with so many aspects of. Uh, of the whole systems, and I think uh, of the whole system, and uh, and I, it's just so wonderful to hear about the systems-based thinking that one thing has to rely on the other. So I just want to thank you for your work from the bottom of my heart because it's just wonderful to see what you're doing, and I can see now where it comes from in terms of you know your early um, childhood and growth, and you know I thank your parents for that, and. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's just wonderful to see the kind of work BPI is doing. I'm I'm so excited about the changes that are here to come. Thank you for the work uh, for the future generations, uh, Rhodes. So and thank you for talking to us. And I'm sure there'll be so much learning. There's been so much learning for me personally, and I think there's going to be so much learning for those who listen to this podcast. So thank you, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for hosting this podcast and getting the word out. And thanks for everything that you do. Um, Let's, let's keep it keep it going. <laughs>